John Leon to base. The hyper jump was successful. I can see the outer hull. Twin stick shooting games are a subgenre that we've taken a look at quite a few times here on Bullet Heaven, but what if twin stick controls were adapted to a side scrolling style of play? If one such game could be made, could it bridge the gap between twin stick and traditional shoot 'em up? We might have the answer with a PC shoot 'em up from Italian developer Mario Malagrino of Next Game Level. Remote Life is a horizontal shooting game released on October 4th, 2019 for Windows PCs. Taking a high-detailed 2D space horror approach to its visual style, and infusing twin-stick controls to a side-scrolling system, how does this game set itself apart from other twin-stickers and horries? Let's take a closer look. Remote Life is a game that flows quite a bit differently than a lot of the traditional side-scrollers we've taken a look at so far, yet also very similarly to most twin stickers. Players will play the game in a mission-based manner, selecting the stage they want to play or repeat. A total of 18 missions await the player, each with a high degree of difficulty that we'll talk about soon. Controlling the player's ship is easy enough, and in this case we'll primarily be describing the inputs on an Xbox-style pad. Either the D-pad or the left analog stick will move the player's ship in their desired direction. In both cases, the ship will move at the same rate, but the analog control has many more degrees of directional travel than the eight that are afforded by the D-pad. Players fire their weapons with either the left or right triggers. Three basic weapon systems are available by default. The A-type Gatling laser, the B-type spread laser, and the C-type missile battery. Selected with the L or R bumpers, these weapons are very capable by default, especially the B-type, but a huge variety of other weapons are available to be equipped by the player. The D-Class bomber attacks have various forms and can be deployed with the B button. Different bomber types hold different amounts of ammunition, but are completely refilled when picked up again. These weapons are fantastic for attacking bosses. Back to the main weapon types though, many different weapons with types A through C associated with them will be dispersed around each stage, which, when obtained, will slot into the weapon system they apply to. All of these weapon pickups have limited ammunition before they default back to the basic shot type, but they will also have differing amounts. Some will last longer than others. Other times, the most powerful weapons will only last a very brief time, though some can still be very effective despite a decent amount of ammo. Here's where things get a little more interesting. Players can aim any weapon they may have with the right analog stick just like a twin stick shooting game. This allows players to aim at and attack enemies in any direction. Given that a constant onslaught of enemies will engage the player from all directions, all the time, this system is particularly helpful. Support units can also be directly controlled in the same manner at the same time, but it's not perfect. Going into this game with the mentality of a twin-stick shooting game, especially using both analog sticks, will probably cause issues for a lot of players. In our case, we play games like Geometry Wars or Debris Infinity very defensively, aiming at foes and moving away while positioning to attack the next wave. Because there is environmental damage and very tight quarters, this playstyle is highly discouraged. The urge to keep moving while shooting is also very strong for us here as well, and we found ourselves dying quite a bit. Using the D-pad may force players like us to think more like a traditional shooting game, but it does end up feeling really unnatural. The symmetry afforded by twin stick games just feels better, and we ended up getting a little uncoordinated with the D-pad as a result. The aim associated with remote life is also a little sketchy, as shots come from the tip of the player's ship's nose rather than what is essentially the center of the craft in normal twin stickers. This means that players need to take two separate central points into account, one for the shots, especially in tight quarters, and the other for the ship to avoid collision. This is especially important as the ship's hitbox is gargantuan by comparison to a lot of modern shooting games. And this brings us to another important issue. A lot of the obstacles and shots in Remote Life escaped our vision in several different ways. For one, the backgrounds do a really good job of hiding a lot of enemies and obstacles in plain sight. It's so bad that it seemed at times as if we just self-destructed rather than hitting something which, upon closer inspection, was a tiny cluster of uh, eggs, I guess, and it happened with very, very regular frequency. Especially when explosions and lighting effects get in the way, this can lead to a very frustrating time. But that's not even the worst offender. There are some really, really tiny shots and obstacles in this game that are very hard for human eyes to even detect. Take these for example. These little points will instantly kill the player and they are a grand total of two pixels wide on a 1080p display. A lot of shots also pass for lighting effects while what seems to be a bullet is harmless, making for a very confusing and frustrating situation that happens constantly. Some are even seemingly invisible when they strike the ship. Remote life is also the king of cheap shots, especially given that all background elements are insta-killer obstacles that can't be shot through with very, very rare exception, and all enemies and their shots can pass right on through. 
that the player can shoot any enemy bullet is helpful, but it's often unintuitive in close quarters thanks to the dual center ship shot setup. And there's more, sometimes the player is able to board a huge superpowered support vehicle but won't be able to exit without it being destroyed. Meanwhile, a number of power-ups will just scroll on past but will be unable to be collected. You know, as a result of being unable to leave the support craft. What? The player starts with a total of four hit points indicated by a row of hearts in the top left-hand corner of the screen. If a player dies and falls below three hearts, others can be picked up to recover the player's life. At the very least, there are an abundance of lives scattered around each stage for those players that may have been hit. These hearts appear in specific areas and if a player is struck to below three HP with a heart nearby, it will immediately appear for pickup. As stated before, Remote Life plays over the course of 18 mission-based stages that are selected on a hub screen. While players will still progress to the next stage automatically when a level is cleared, dying will send players to the hub screen to select the stage they wish to take on. Given that players can always continue from the last unlocked stage and that each stage basically boils down to memorization, the general replayability is, unfortunately, relatively low. At the very least, the general monotony to remote life is broken up with some admittedly fun escort stages and omnidirectional portions that require complete target destruction to progress. And I mean, when was the last time an escort mission was ever fun by comparison to the main game? But of course, there's problems here too, as there's other reasons players may not want to revisit old stages. When getting footage, my file was demoted, relocking a previously available ship despite the condition for using it being satisfied which means that players will need to re-clear the level just to reuse a ship that should have already been unlocked according to the game itself. All of this is actually pretty disappointing because we really want to like what's here. There are some neat unlockables here including a really cool physical one which we'll talk about soon. But the huge visibility issues in remote life paired with the ever so off control severely hampers the fun that we had with it in general. The concept is very novel and the system would be great if things like the ship's hitbox and obstacle visibility were better balanced out, but as it is, especially since memorization is all players really need here, remote life's greatest challenges are purely technical in nature, rather than coming from the game's actual structure or difficulty. We can firmly say remote life isn't especially fun as a result. Remote Life does not incorporate a scoring system of any kind. Played entirely for survival in a mission-to-mission -mission manner, the story takes a front seat here. It might be for the best though, as Remote Life doesn't have a ton of room nor the structure for an in-depth scoring system. At best, it would bloat the game and clutter the already hard-to-see screen when trying to avoid obstacles. Generally, it would be superfluous at best. But with no scoring system to speak of, this also reduces the amount of replay the game has in general as well, as there is no real reason to revisit a stage that has already been cleared, especially with the risk of the aforementioned demotion. Base to Sentinel-52, the particle accelerator is ready. Please bring your ship in the center of the accelerator and wait for the hyper jump. You will jump straight inside the hive. Regarding your calculations, the center of the hive is empty, and there you can destroy it from inside. Be careful, good luck. Roger, thank you base. Things do get a little better though. Due to the inherent lack of a scoring system and the mission-based nature of the game's progression, Remote Life seems to have put all of its stats into its presentation, and what's here mostly works, while other things work in, uh, unintended ways. So let's talk visuals. Outside of the fact that a giant buttload of hazards can't really be seen, there's a huge amount of detail and decent animation behind everything on screen. The backdrops are dreary and alien, the creatures are suitably creepy, and there are all kinds of gross biomechanical bits all over the game that remind the player that some really disturbing business is going down here. Players might also be surprised to see that the entire game is actually 2D, especially if static screenshots and animated GIFs are all they've ever seen. At a glance, it definitely looks like a high-resolution 3D game. The 2D visuals don't stop it from looking pretty awesome though. Well, when it can be seen anyway. Games with this kind of 2D presentation rarely pull it off, looking very cheap in the process. While a touch of cheapness definitely exists, we like what's here. We just want to be able to see what's killing us is all. On the sound front, the music has some decent chops, though we haven't encountered any real standouts. The music does change to suit various sections of the game though, which is a good touch. As solid as the main soundtrack is, there are some weird skips in the music from time to time, which is quite jarring when it happens. We also don't really care for the game over sound, it's just plain irritating. 
At least the sound effects are quite decent, with a number of great effects in the menus, weapons, creatures, and explosions. Well, except for those bomb creatures, the countdowns are loud and shrill. But uh, <laughs> then there's the VO, which was produced using the kind of text-to-speech synthesis that is commonly used nowadays in place of narration in hastily produced YouTube videos and, more dubiously, scammer robocalls. This makes for some hilariously stilted delivery, like this. John Leon to base. I have discovered the crew of Hope 2. It's horrible. They are floating in a kind of glass tubes. I think they are all dead. Again, this freaking barrels. What could they be? But the absolute coolest feature of all time with Remote Life is the level 16 unlockable, a 3D printable game over skull. We haven't encountered this in any game to date, much less a shmup, but we absolutely want more games to include this feature. Offering unlockable 3D printable models is absolutely one of the coolest ideas to come out of modern gaming. Rounding out the presentation is a slightly obtuse but nicely designed menu system that does the job for its applied use, but maybe not as efficiently as it could be. Moving a cursor with the D-pad or analog stick is fine, we guess, but it's not as intuitive as classic D-pad navigation. We did notice a couple of issues with this build under the hood as well. If players would like to record their gameplay, they should not use Windows to do it. We used OBS this time around, as the sound will not be captured through Windows. It has been said that GeForce Experience also works, but we didn't test that. This workaround is also useless for Radeon users. Additionally, there are graphical issues with the Steam overlay on the bottom right-hand corner of the screen that never go away. Curious. Options also exist for players to receive visual alerts for incoming enemies from the rear, as well as difficulty options and filters to make the game even harder to see. One final note, players can also opt for keyboard and mouse controls, where the ship is controlled with WASD and the weapon management aim and fire is handled with the mouse. This may or may not work better for players that don't enjoy the setup on the controller, but in the end, how does remote life stack up? Let's take a look. All of the control schemes and variations in Remote Life have issues that keep them from feeling especially good. Players might be able to acclimate to their quirks, but for the kind of stage design players will endure, the controls are ultimately inadequate. Boiling down to memorization, most of the difficulty in Remote Life comes from a giant hitbox and hidden threats due to poor visibility of enemies, hazards, and shots, and the unfair enemy advantage of moving and shooting through backgrounds. There are 18 patience-testingly long stages to Remote Life, but with very little replay and no scoring to speak of, its true length suffers. Sticking through to the end might well be this game's greatest challenge. It frustrates us severely when we keep getting killed by camouflage and near-invisible hazards. But on its own, the visual style in Remote Life is actually really, really good. Some serious tweaks to the hazard and shot visibility are, once again, sorely needed though. Slightly less good is the sound, with admittedly 99% good sound effects, somewhat decent but glitchy music, and a just plain terrible game over effect. This is a game with a good amount of ingenuity, though it isn't as well implemented as it could be. The groundwork is here for something great though, and the inclusion of digital to physical extras is mind-blowingly awesome. But of course, there's another issue. Here's where things get really messy. There are vastly different prices around the world for this game. In Canada, it's about $25, but in Kazakhstan, it's only nine after conversion. At a constant 10 US dollars, this might have been a great value. At 25 Canadian though, especially when other countries are getting it for like a third the price, it's only moderately priced with iffy value. PC shoot 'em ups are something we need to get back into, and we have a few that we're looking to get in on in future episodes of Bullet Heaven. Remote Life is a neat game, flawed as it is, and it's definitely worth at least a look. We would highly recommend downloading the demo first. In the end, with its major issues, Remote Life gets a 2.75 out of 5. You can get a copy of Remote Life on Steam today for, well, different amounts of money depending where you live, apparently. Have you been checking out the RF Generation Shmup Club and Shoot the Corecast? They play a new shmup every single month, all month long, and this month they're playing Tiger Heli. So we're flying in with our own review, coming up in episode 254 of Bullet Heaven. See you all in the next episode.